Hi everyone, uh, we'll start soon. Um, I, I, I posted the um, paper that we will be discussing in the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll start soon. Thank you. Hi Katie, you want to come up? How are you? Hey, how are you? Hello, hello. How are you, my love? Um, it's good to have a room at a time I'm awake. Um, I'm excited for this conversation and good to hear and see you, my love. Yeah, same here. I, uh, we haven't talked for a while, but yeah, I'm glad I could schedule a room in your time finally again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a little bit sick today, so my voice is not the best, but I'll try to to I'll try to do my best. <laughs> we have around five minutes, so um, yeah, we'll start in five minutes. In the meantime, feel free to share the room, everyone, with people you think that would be interested, and um, yeah, we'll start shortly. Thank you. Sorry to hear you're not well. Take care of your voice. Um, I'm sure there's lots of people to help and you're always such a great moderator anyway. Um, and just type in the chat or anything if you need any support. Thank you so much, Katie. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm taking a lot of zinc and stuff, so uh, we'll be fine soon. <laughs> The regular cold. We are back in, you know, being exposed to getting colds and and stuff like that in the winter. So, Oh, I already love the study that's in the chat below. Just um, having a quick glance on it. Really, really encourage everyone to look in the chat and have a look about, look at the article scientific study that's going to be discussed today. Looks absolutely fascinating. And um, thanks for bringing in so many amazing speakers. Talk about science, as always. There you are. Uh, hi, Isaac. Thank you for coming. We were just talking about your paper, how cool, how interesting it is. So thank you. Hi everyone. Hi, hello. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Great. Brilliant. Okay. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Everything my... is okay. <laughs> my voice is a little bit off. This is not my regular voice, but I'll do my best to to sound okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it uh, sounds perfectly fine. Um, can people see the presentation? Just yeah, okay. I'll put it up uh, now. Uh, one sec. Okay. The paper is shared in the chat, also. Um, mm -hmm. So access mm. it. And yeah, I can see it. Here. There. All right. Uh, should be working now so okay so we have like three more minutes right before we yeah. have to mm -hmm. okay. great great hi it's katie um Dr. Franken, thank you so much for being here. Um, please take your time for a few minutes before we start. Just wanted to say welcome to Clubhouse and um, in the Science Society. Katerina hosts these amazing rooms and there's always so many amazing questions. Um, just as you came in, um, I was nerding out about your study that's posted in the chat and now we can all um, download the um, the talk that you're going to give. So we're really, really looking forward to 
um, a really interesting conversation. I'm sure there'll be many questions and thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for having me and for, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear any thoughts people might have about this. Yeah, we'll start in a minute. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, hi everyone. And um, we um, are very honored to have our guest speaker here today. So feel free to share the room. If you think this is something um, your friends or anyone would like to um, listen to. And uh, we are just about to start. So, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. And um, of course, a special thank you um, to Isaac here um, that took his time out of his busy schedule to, to um, yeah, talk about his really interesting research. And I think it's also really important for all of us. Um, so, yeah, I think we can start now. So, um, welcome, Isaac, as Katie said. So, uh, well, um, thank you so much for being here. And before we start, um, I'll give a short introduction so people get to know you a little bit better. And um, if it's okay with you, we usually ask a few interview questions before we dive into your research. Of course. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Um, Itzik Fredkin, he um, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he did his education um, at the University of Ben Gurion, University of Negev, um, until uh, 2012. And then he was a clinical psychology uh, student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a PhD student also at the University of Jerusalem. And um, yeah, as I said, um, after um, all this um, education, he is now a postdoctoral researcher and we will hear about um, the really interesting uh, research you're doing here today. And um, a question we usually ask our guest speaker is, how did you um, choose the path of, um, you know, doing the scientific research? Was it something you always uh, wanted to do? Was it maybe a class you took, a book you read, or something that sparked your interest to choose this path? Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction. I hope um, everyone can hear me well. Um, it's, it's a really good question you're asking. Um, I'll try to answer it briefly. Um, actually, I, I started uh, with interest um, in clinical psychology and being a therapist, and I indeed completed part of the route um, that clinical psychologists have to do to actually um, treat people with some practice and so and along the way I, I really got more and more interested in uh, research both uh, from the methodological and the theoretical perspective um, more specifically and maybe using this to sort of um, continue to the um, topic of this talk um, throughout my research career, and I assume that even before that, before I was so, you know, was sort of able to def define this thing as research, 
I, I became more and more interested in this thing we so intuitively call uh, thought, um, which is something we obviously always experienced, uh, and even though it's so intuitive to us and, and something that we know um, so well from ourselves, um, there, there really is no, not enough um, understanding um, of, of course, what thoughts actually are, but more specifically, um, how thoughts work. So I, I, I will obviously not answer the first question, what thoughts actually are today. I will barely answer the second question, but what I will talk about um, touches upon that, which is a question um, through which mechanisms, through which processes do thoughts work? Um, so just one correction about my bio, I'm now a postdoc uh, researcher at uh, the Max Planck uh, uh, Computational Psychiatry Institute at, in London at UCL. And I will, what I will present is mostly um, the study we I've done in the, at the Hebrew University, which is also the paper uh, you see in the chat, but I've also discussed some additional applications we're using for the same general method uh in in other contexts uh in my current uh research well thank you for that and um it's really interesting that you this question about um thoughts and thought processes and and what they are i think uh, that's really interesting and is there maybe for this project or yeah for this project um some sort of background story how how came it about how did you manage to then actually do this project um was it easy to convince people to get a grant or um yeah is there some sort of um backstory um yeah i just have to recall what the backstory was um so during my PhD, um, I studied obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, um, but also people who don't have OCD um, often experience what is called intrusive thoughts. Um, and this concept has always fascinated me and, and part of my PhD was focused on intrusive thoughts, but um, t to an extent what I felt was missing in my PhD research is, is, is a better understanding of sort of how thoughts actually work. So most of my research up to that point, actually most of the research in clinical psychology in general, um, sort of views this idea of thoughts from two perspectives, either as um, trying to understand what people think from their introspection, from how they perceive their thoughts, or alternatively, um, from simply trying to infer what people think from what they say, from uh, their um, the way they express their thoughts. And what I, I was really looking for, and I am still looking for, is is into having um, ways to try and tap what people actually think in as objective manner as possible, if if that's the thing. Um, and I think in, in a sense, um, the project and even more so the method I will present today tries to focus on exactly that. So um, should I just, I think I just continue unless um, people have questions. Um, I, I, sh I should say um, that if um, people feel um, midway that there's something that's uh, very, very unclear. So please feel free to interrupt. Uh, and if you have more sort of uh, um, broad questions that are not clarification, so we'll be happy to stay at the end and do it uh, for as much time as needed. So um, if you have the presentation in front of you, or if you don't, uh, you can see that the, the first um, slide, whatever, conveys a very, very non-exhaustive introduction into this idea of free association. So we're basically stepping from this very 
abstract idea of thoughts to the more concrete idea of free association. But starting from the very beginning of uh, psychodynamic um, theories, but also cognitive theories in psychology, um, free associations and, and have been thought um, to, to, to provide us a, maybe a good glimpse into, into people, what people actually think. And even though this starts with Freud, um, the, the better example of the type of free association we're using today comes from Carl Jung, who was also a, uh, a psychodynamic, uh, famous psychodynamic uh, analyst, therapist. And th the reason for which Jung is more interested, interesting in, in this um, perspective is that w whereas Freud, when using free association technique, he basically asked people to, to just speak freely in a, in a very non-restricted manner, Jung asked people for a single word association. So he presented them with certain keywords. Um, so for example, in the slide, you can see the keyword um, head and asked them to say only one association. And then one of the things that he sort of one of the intuitions he had about this very, very preliminary task, uh, and I'll be citing him here, is the first thing that strikes us, Jung says, is the fact that many test persons, um, which is just people, show a marked prolongation of the reaction time. So the reaction time here would be how long it takes people to say in a specific association. This would seem to be suggestive, suggestive of intellectual difficulties, wrongly, however, for we are often dealing with very intelligent persons of fluent speech. The explanation lies rather in the emotions. So the idea that, uh, sort of the intuition that, that Jung had here is that we can use not only the actual associations people give us, but also the reaction times to infer something about uh, many different um, complex processes that have to do with emotions, with cognitive control, with semantic memory, and so on, uh, that all of, all of which sort of um, affect um, these two quantities, the association and the reaction time. Now, the, f the, the main question we ask in, 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 in this first study, which is also the, the, the paper you see, is can we use um, some of these principles to understand how people control their thoughts? And, and obviously difficulties in controlling one's thoughts are a universal um, concern. Uh, it is also more prevalent in specific psychiatric disorders such as OCD, um, for example. Um, but yet again, like I said before, most of what we know about um, how people control their thoughts up to this point is, is based on their self-report, on how they report themselves controlling their thoughts, or, or on what types of thoughts they report or, or do not report. And what one of the problems with this is that all of the attempts successful or unsuccessful, to control one's thoughts on which people can actually report are by definition um, something we can call forms of reactive control. The idea here is that if people are aware to an attempt to control or to inhibit or to stop a certain thought, it means that this thought is, has already come to this person's mind. And the question we wanted to ask is, can people in general use what is known in cognitive science as proactive control? And proactive control here would mean, can people use any type of strategy, allowing them to reduce the probability that a certain thought will come to mind in the first place? Now, to, to, to demonstrate proactive control in a way that it may, maybe makes more sense, think about yourself um, driving in a car. And let's say that you you like um, standing with a car in front of a traffic light, and let's say that you want to continue straight, but then you have another traffic light um, destined for those who want to turn left that suddenly becomes green. In many cases, this will you will sort of pay attention to this 
event happening to the traffic light becoming green and you will need to inhibit this very automatic behavior of starting to drive. So this would be an example of reactive control. Something about the behavior already starts and you have to inhibit it after it already started. But now consider something different. You're again in the car standing in front of the traffic light, but then the traffic light, uh, one of the traffic lights for the pedestrians becomes um, green instead of red somewhere in your uh, um, like somewhere when you can actually see it. In many cases, you won't even pay attention to that. You will be able to filter that completely. Um, and so this, the, this event will not trigger any automatic response of starting to drive the car or something like that, and therefore will not require any reactive inhibition. So the question is, can people do the same for thoughts? Can they, in some sense, prevent or, or completely ignore specific thoughts in, in, in a way that they don't even come to mind. Um, I, I can see there are many questions in the chat and unfortunately I can attend to them um, currently. So if someone has a pressing matter, please feel free to interrupt. So the way we examine this is, is using a an sort of new free association task where we simply showed people the same keyword, not one time, but several times. So for example, we showed people the keyword um, table um, five times, not one after the other. There were other keywords in between, but still five times. And we ask participants in one group to avoid reporting the same association twice. So in the second, on the second slide in the presentation, if you, if, if you have it in front of you, um, we sort of envision this, this process where the first time people see the keyword table, they, they write or they say chair. But then the second time, um, people in this suppressed group were asked not to say uh, chair again, and they had to come up with a different association. And the question is, how do they do it? Do they do it using reactive control or proactive control? In other words, do they have to first think the association table and then to reject it and replace it, which is reactive, or can they avoid thinking the association table for the second time altogether and therefore um, they can more efficiently think of a different association. One of the empirical predictions of the difference between these two mechanisms has to do with the reaction times. So let's say that people in the second time report not chair, but actually, I mean, do the task well, they report a different association. So for example, the association desk. The question is how long does it take them um, to say or to write this new association? Under the reactive control hypothesis, um, one of the most basic predictions is that it will take them uh, more time than what it took them to report the first association um, to the word table. And the reason for which it would take them more time is because they have to think of this first repeated association to reject it and then to come up with a new association. And this is a process that is um, to some extent effortful and, and takes time. Um, so, just to sort of reiterate, under reactive control, we expect these new associations to repeated cues to, to be prolonged in, 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 or delayed in their reaction times. Conversely, under proactive control, we might expect either no such prolongation of reaction time, so people can either be as fast, or we have even a good reason to believe that people might be faster if they use proactive control. The reason for that is because when we try to come up with an association, we basically have many, many different associations competing. And this competition by itself, it, it is something that takes time. And if people are able to completely filter out the, the previous association um, table from their sort of memory, that means that there's less competition between less associations. And if there's less competition, we might expect this, the, the response to take less time. So the basic prediction here would be um, prolonged responses to new associations um, would be evidence for reactive control, whereas um, the same speed or facilitated responses would be evidence for proactive control. 
On the third slide, we can see the actual results and the results show us that specifically in the uh, suppressed group, there is a considerable difference between uh, the time it took people to say a new association to repeated queue than the time it took them to say uh, the first association to you know, on the first time this queue was presented. And, and we see basically prolongation. And this basic result, as I implied before, uh, seems to suggest that people mostly use reactive control over their thoughts. So at least when we look at behavior, we can see no evidence for proactive thought control, no evidence that people are able to filter out completely unwanted thoughts, unwanted associations. However, we took one step further trying to understand um, in a more detailed manner, what exactly is happening. And we did this with something that is, we can call mathematical or computational modeling. The basic idea behind mathematical modeling and cognition is that we formalize set of equations that obviously um, do not fully reflect the very complex cognitive process that, that is going on, but tries to approximate some components of this cognitive process. And this computational model uh, the one we used uh, was based on the associations people reported and on the reaction times, and it had two key variables, two key, we call it parameters. Um, and these parameters convey exactly um, these two mechanisms I, I, I mentioned before. One of the parameters, which we call associative strength modification parameter, is a parameter that tries to examine to, after people see the word table um, and say, let's say, uh, chair for the first time, what happens to the strength of this association chair? Does it become weaker, um, suggesting proactive control? Does it stay the same? Or maybe it becomes stronger. Maybe after saying an association for the first time, it becomes stronger. In other words, maybe after we think a certain thought, the probability that this thought will recur again in the same context uh, increases. The other parameter is simply the thought rejection parameter, and it just and, and it simply um, quantifies the probability that after a, a person actually thinks about uh, repeated association, what is the probability that this person will reject the association and try to come up with an alternative? On the fifth slide, we can see the results. So the first very not surprising results is that people in the suppressed group uh, compared to people in a control group, and I didn't say that before, but people in the control group were basically, um, they did the same task, but they were not asked to um, suppress repeated associations. They, 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 they were not asked to report them as well, but they were free to do as they choose. So the first very um, expected finding we see is that people in the suppressed group had a higher rejection probability. They had a much higher probability of rejecting repeating associations, so much higher reactive control. The second thing we see is th that the um, associative strength modification parameter, uh, for which we use the Greek letter rho here, um, is positive in both groups. And a positive parameter here would mean that in both groups, saying an association, writing an association, increased its strength in the short term. In both groups, in other words, um, thinking or, or expressing a thought made it more likely to recur. However, so this again shows us that there's no full proactive control. There's no ability to reduce the strength of repeated associations. However, another very interesting finding is that people in the, for people in the suppressed group, this increase in the strength of repeated associations was not as strong as it was in the control group. In other words, even though in general, having a thought increases its strength, it seems like people have some proactive control over the extent to which this happens. In, on the sixth slide, um, we, we see um, why this might be important. Specifically, what we see 
um, in this on the slide are correlations between the two parameters and between a, a self-report scale called the thought suppression inventory, which basically measures people's self-reported ability to control unwanted thoughts in their daily lives. And what we see is that first, people in the suppress group um, who were better, who reported being better at sort of controlling their unwanted thoughts in their lives, um, were also better at rejecting unwanted associations. But the second very intriguing thing that we see is that even for people in the control group who were not asked to suppress associations, this associative strength modification parameter was correlated with um, how well people actually suppress thoughts in their daily lives. And what we see here is that people who are better at suppressing unwanted thoughts in their lives um, also show reduced um, um, reinforcement of repeated thoughts or repeated associations. So to, to conclude this basic idea, what we found is that as, as a most sort of general finding, people, when we measure in an objective manner based on reaction times, um, how people control their thoughts, people mostly use reactive thought control. People mostly have to sort of think a thought in order to be able to reject it. However, we also found that people are able to um, make sure that this unwanted thought will not come to mind as much as it otherwise could have. And this happens not because they can weaken its strength, but because they can make sure that it does not become overly or excessively strong over time. I think that this um, really speaks of um, an experience that might be familiar to us all in, in the sense that sometimes thoughts, um, unwanted thoughts can become so um, upsetting and stressing and maybe even debilitating because they, 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 they become stronger and stronger over time and, and we sort of can find ourselves stuck uh, thinking the same thought, being unable to exit this, this loop. And what we found here is that in general, it seems like people have some sort of probably automatic mechanism allowing them to uh, make sure that this um, self-reinforcing effect of thoughts is, is not as strong as it otherwise could have been. Um, right, Th so the next um, parts have to do with, with a slightly different study. So, so I, I think that I, I will um, pause for um, five or so minutes um, to see if people have any specific questions about this first part before continuing to the second part. Hi, it's Katie. Just wanted to say absolutely fascinating, um, Dr. Franken. There's a lot of, um, I know you can't multitask while you're giving a presentation. There's a lot of really fascinating questions in the chat. Um, I don't think anything is so um, pressing at the moment, um, but just for anyone that is in the audience and you want to come up and ask a question, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and we will bring you up. Otherwise, we'll relay the questions um, at the end of your presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, Hi. So I had a question about what you were just speaking on. You said there were there either was or might be a mechanism for this. And I was curious if that might be the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sorry, I think I think I lost okay. you. Maybe it's, no, my, maybe it's my connection. No, I'm terrible at asking questions. So you were just speaking about, um, if I could bring up the slide, then maybe, because I wasn't looking at it, I was getting dressed. Um, maybe it discusses it there, but I don't see it. Uh, you were just speaking about their, about thoughts getting stuck in someone's head. Um, 
and there being a mechanism for that. And I was just wondering if you could speak more to it. I had an idea, but I wanted I really just if you could speak more to it, that'd be better, beneficial. Right. So, the, so I, in, in a sense, I, I mentioned two mechanisms that are related to that. The first is is the mere fact that it seems that universally, when we think something, um, in a specific context, this thought becomes stronger, at least uh, on the short term. Right. The way we see it in our task is that when people, we we show them the board chair, they come up with the association. Sorry, we show them the board table, they come up with the association chair. Let's say. Um, the strength of this association strengthens at the short term, making it more likely to recur than it was in, in the beginning. The second mechanism, which is um, more novel and more interesting, I, I think, is that when we take a specific group of people, asking them to, um, in a sense, control um, their thoughts, these people do show uh, some implicit ability to make sure that this mechanism I mentioned, the self-enforcing um, mechanism, is to some extent mitigated and, and is not as strong as it otherwise could have been. Now, we, we don't fully understand how exactly people do that, but it seems, uh, logically speaking, that this um, this sort of partial proactive control mechanism cannot be very effortful because if people were trying to very effortfully control their thoughts, um, it, 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 it couldn't have helped them mitigate uh, the increase in its uh, strength over time. So we, we suspect that this is some sort of an automatic mechanism. In other words, by simply knowing that you, um, a certain thought is an unwanted thought, it is, something that can be enough to um, to activate this automatic mechanism that um, makes sure it does not become overly strong and overly excessive over time. Um, but, but again, we definitely need more um, research to understand how exactly this mechanism works. And to my point, I was asking if that might be like related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If that's what brings possibly like possibly brings the um, the ideas to the forefront that you then have to either swipe away or otherwise do away with. I, I'm, I, I don't know. The, the truth is, um, I, I don't know exactly. Um, it's an interesting question, but yeah. We need some 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 concrete way to actually examine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, it's Katie. Thanks so much for the question, um, Nerdish, and also welcome to the stage. Amazing, Dr. Roshanat. Really grateful to have you here. Um, please go ahead and um, share if you would like to. Thank you so much, Katie, and hi everybody, and thanks for the ping, Katie. I would have been uh, very disappointed to miss this room, and unfortunately, I, I did miss the early parts, but. Um, I'm wondering if what Jeremy's asking is related to attention and um, emotional control. So uh, I'll ask a question that's somewhat in between both of those, which is, um, I don't know specifically because I did miss the beginning, unfortunately, and I'll listen to the replay. Uh, when you're talking about the proactive, so what I'm thinking of is, you know, we fall into so statistically, right, about 95% of our thoughts are repetitive, right? And about 80% are negative. So the, that emotional state comes in, goes into the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, typically when we think about rumination and these repetitive thoughts and sort of out of control, repetitive thoughts that people don't want, the negative ones. And, um, and considered thought uh, in the DLPFC mitigates that. So when you're looking at those people who are better at the proactive, have you been able to, and I know you just said um, that you are looking deeper into the mechanisms, have you been able to see what that has to do with respect to like the ACC, um, you know, habitual responses, impulse control, and, um, and then the um, effect of the limbic system on this, right? Because also depressive thoughts go into the DMPFC. So I'm just wondering where you might be along that pathway. 
Yeah, it's thank you. It's it's a, it's a really really interesting question. Um, one that we have not examined yet. The study um, was merely behavior. We didn't do any imaging. Um, uh, one thing I, I should sort of my hypothesis would be that these traditional inhibitory mechanisms, um, at least some of them, I'm not sure about the DLPFC, but maybe the, I, the, the inferior frontal gyrus, for example, as a um, brain area that is involved in inhibition, would correlate more with what we call the reactive thought control. Because what happens in, I mean, it's, it's a good question of what happens in, in the proactive thought control. What exactly happens at the brain that allows people to, um, that sort of Right, is it just a changes, redirect? Yeah, changes, exactly. Changes the basically the, the, the semantic networks online, right? Changes like the dynamics uh, or the dynamic structure, if I may, may call it that, of, of the semantic networks um, and, uh, online according to one's goals and according to the task and according to their uh, um, recent history. Um, and I, I would suspect, therefore, that anything that should have to do with proactive thought control would be found in the more basic semantic or semantic control uh, mechanisms. So sort of mediotemporal and, 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 and so on. But this is definitely something we uh, um, want to examine. Right. So um, I, I think that, uh, um, thank you for this very, very uh, uh, interesting questions. I, I think I wanna um, take the next um, seven, 10 minutes to, to uh, present the, the second part. Uh, and then we can have a broader discussion about both of them, about the first or about the second. So one of the key um, sort of ideas that we try to capture here, and, and we partially succeeded, but only partially, is, um, this distinction between um, what we think and what we eventually express. And we try to examine how people are able not to express specific um, associations. Is it through reactive or through proactive thought control? This basic question of, of um, the possible association between what we think and how we speak or what we express is, is also very relevant to another type of, um, we can call it psychiatric um, phenotype or psychiatric phenomena. And this phenomena is traditionally called formal thought disorder. And, and it, there's a, some um, very uh, prototypical example on um, slide seven. Formal thought disorder is usually diagnosed in the context of psychosis or schizophrenia. Some studies suggest it to, to be as prevalent as in 50% uh, of people who have uh, schizophrenia or psychosis. Uh, it is defined as some disruption in um, either language or thinking. And the most prototypical example would be this sort of incoherent speech or disorganized tangential speech. And this is a, so the, the example that we, I, I show here on the slide is from an interview where uh, the, 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 let's say the therapist asks a patient, what city are you from? And then the patient starts answering, well, that's a hard question to answer. I was born in Marburg, but my parents met in Cologne. This was a hard time. They had to go through many financial difficulties. It was during the war and we had to flee from the city. And this is just one type of example showing us how speech might become tangential, sort of lose the, the original point and, and to an extent become incoherent. On the slide, you also have a link to a very very good YouTube video um, by um, someone who, um, a woman who basically um, sort of describes her experience with uh, schizophrenia in, in a very accessible and, and brilliant manner, I, I should say. And this specific video is about her experience with scattered thoughts and thought disorder. Now, the reason for which this whole model I showed you is relevant for thought disorder is because we don't really understand. We, as clinicians, uh, as um, researchers, um, we don't understand what 
explains such incoherence in speech that we um, see in uh, schizophrenia, but we might also see in even in a more mild form in other types of uh, phenomenology. So there were some previous suggestions about HDHD, for example, about um, autism, um, maybe OCD is somehow related to that. And the, the thing that we don't understand is whether the problem lies in uh, whether people who um, at times uh, find themselves speaking in a somewhat less coherent manner or maybe less organized manner, is it because their thoughts are also disorganized? Or is it actually because they, the, the deficit lies in the ability to, to um, control or to filter uh, the um, types of maybe normal slippages of thoughts that we all might experience, right? So is this, does this patient in this specific example, was it just a difficulty in inhibiting this, this um, um, derailment of thought we see these details about the financial difficulties in the war and and maybe other people might sort of have these thoughts as well but might be better at inhibiting and not expressing them or is it really about um, the level of the thought and in this second study we, we examined this question in, in a very large uh, uh, general population study so it's not a clinical study and not a clinical uh, sample we deliberately wanted to examine how this idea of formal thought disorder is organized in the general population and the way we we did it is we administered a bunch of uh, um, psychiatric questionnaires and examined what we call a factor structure i mean the, the way they are organized in the population. And then we examined for each of the latent psychiatric dimensions we found whether um, it shows um, any type of um, disorganization or atypicality in speech or in writing or in narratives. And if so, what can explain that? So um, on the eighth slide, you can see um, a demonstration of the two mechanisms I, I discussed. And, and examined in a free association task, but here associations are given to color rather than to specific words. So let's say that we ask people just to say whatever association comes to mind to a specific color. And what you see on that slide is two potential uh, mechanisms. On the top mechanism, um, formal thought disorder. So for example, expressing the fact that people when seeing these sort of bluish color, instead of saying the more typical stronger association sky, they might say the association pillow, for example. So uh, is it because um, their semantic maps or semantic um, networks are sort of more um, stochastic, more dispersed, less constrained? Is it at the thought level? Or is it because, as shown at the bottom um, illustration, um, because they're less able to uh, reject uh, these sort of loose associations that might come to everyone's uh, mind uh, at the same degree? And um, so basically, the model I have just shown you that does exactly that. It, it allows us to um, dissociate the processes that, that um, affect the type of associations that come to mind from the processes that control um, the different filtering control or um, executive um, regulation processes people use to decide which associations to report and which not to report. What we found is, is really quite fascinating, I think. We found, uh, we found a bunch of psychiatric dimensions, but for I will present here only three of them because they showed a very different um, sort of pattern of um, results. The first psychiatric dimension that was relevant, and, and I'm now on the ninth, on slide number nine, uh, um, we called it self-reported eccentricity because it uh, literally includes items where people say about themselves things like, I talk in ways that other people find strange. I use long and unusual words to say simple things. We found that people who say such things about themselves indeed um, produce more atypical associations in our free association task. And we also ask them to produce a free sort of narrative 
and their narratives were also slightly more atypical. Examining um, using the model what causes such atypical associations indicated um, across two replications that it was mostly about um, the level of the actual thought or the constraint or organization of the actual thought rather than at the level of um, inhibition. So it suggested that at least in this sort of psychiatric dimension, atypical language is the result of uh, slightly less organized or uh, less constrained or maybe more stochastic thinking or associative processes. Now, the reason for which it is so interesting is that we found two other psychiatric dimensions with a completely different pattern. The, the second psychiatric dimension shown on slide 10 is something we can call social anxiety. And it, in, it includes items such as, I get anxious when meeting people for the first time. I sometimes I avoid going to places where there will be many people because I will get anxious. Now, I should say that the psychiatric dimensions themselves, they're positively correlated. In many cases, people who have higher social anxiety, not in many cases, but in some, in general, people who have higher social anxiety have a slightly higher tendency of having a higher self-reported eccentricity. However, the pattern of results we found was completely the opposite in the sense that people with high-end social anxiety produced more typical narratives. To, they, they, and their, um, their organization of the associations was more peaked, less stochastic, and more constrained. The third dimension I wanted to present is something we call uh, suspiciousness. It includes different um, items that have to do both with actual suspiciousness, being suspicious of other people's intentions, but also in just difficulties at um, sort of disclosing one's feelings to other people and so on. So for example, it included items such as, I often have to keep an eye out to stop people from taking advantage of me, or I find it hard to be emotionally close to other people. What was so fascinating about this um, dimension is that it did not show um, more or less atypical narratives or associations. It showed, um, at least not significantly so. However, when we examine um, the processes using the computational model, it, sh it showed us that the reason for which we don't really see very um, atypical associations in this group is not because they don't think of atypical associations, but rather because when they think of atypical associations, they um, use um, increased control or filtering mechanisms to make sure they don't um, say those associations out loud. And we see this at the bottom plot in the sense that we, we can see that the associative constraint parameter of this group is similar to the one of the eccentricity group, but then um, the executive regulation parameter um, goes to the other direction, to the positive direction, suggesting um, increased uh, regulation. So what I find so fascinating about the study is that we have three psychiatric dimensions here, all of which are to some extent positively correlated to one another, all of which are related um, maybe etiologically to difficult to, to different um, difficulties in, in maybe social history or maybe different experiences in the social world. It could be different things like isolation, bullying. We don't know. We didn't examine these specific things. But the pattern of uh, use of language and thought we see is remarkably different. Potentially, it's telling us something about the coping mechanism people use in order to deal with either current or past difficulties, uh, 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 interpersonal um, difficulties. Uh, do people simply accept themselves being different, as in self-reported eccentricity, and just report different associations, different, narrati different narratives? Do people really, really try not to be different, and therefore they, they, they produce excessively, in a sense, typical narratives? Or do people know that they're somewhat different, but try to hide it because they don't trust other people, which is what we might see in suspiciousness? Um, yeah, that, 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 so, so, um, these are, 
again, there's so much more to be done here to actually establish and, and explore these findings. But in general, it just shows us how this uh, type of mathematical modeling in a very simple free association task can teach us many interesting things about this interaction between um, how we think and how we control both our thoughts and the way we express them. Yeah, that's it for my part. Thank you. Hi, it's Katie. Thank you so much, Dr. Franken, for a really, really fascinating um, talk. I uh, just want to also welcome everyone that's come and joined us in the room as well. Um, if you have missed the earlier part of the conversation, um, this will be on replay, so you're welcome to listen back um, and hear the rest of the conversation. Otherwise, both in the chat, um, there is a link to the scientific research study um, published paper and also a link um, at the top of the room to the PowerPoint PDF that Dr. Isaac, um, Dr. Franken, sorry, has just run us through. Um, so thanks everyone for being here in the Science Society. Again, thank you for an amazing conversation. Um, really grateful also to have Nerdish and um, of course, thank you Katerina for facilitating these amazing conversations as always. And we have the amazing Dr. Roshnak, who is also a neuroscientist. So um, also perfect to be here on stage. Um, thank you everyone for all the shares to the room. Really, really great to see so many people here and the chats and the discussion. We will relay chats and the discussion, but in the meantime, if anyone is available and would like to come up on stage you're more than welcome to raise your hand um, and we will have a bit of time to answer questions so thank you so much again for being here um, really really fascinating research and grateful for you to share it with us thank you thank you so much happy to and i'm happy to take questions Um, yeah, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I, I agree with Katie. This is, um, I really appreciate, you know, how systematic and that you use computational models to, um, to get to the bottom of this, basically, of these thought processes. I think that is, um, fascinating and, um, and, a really great way to look at this um, and um, I kind of wanted to um, ask you how do you think um, maybe you know for a general question for a general audience so how do you think people can maybe use this insight that you um, presented to us um, in everyday life um, do you have maybe maybe it's a bad question but do you have something for people in everyday life to kind of take away from how to to control their thoughts yeah it's definitely not a bad question it's an excellent question it's a super important question uh i, I i'm afraid i don't have a good answer that's a problem um, I, I wouldn't dare to offer something that is not uh, scientifically established. Uh, and I, I should say that we are examining um, or planning to examine using the, the, the first task I showed you, um, what different instructions or different manipulations can help with either proactive or reactive control. One intuition I would like to stress that I hinted at uh, before is that my interpretation, practical interpretation of these findings is in a sense that trusting our brain, if we might say so, or trusting the automatic processes that, that um, are in place to do some of the thought control work for us in a non-effortful manner, um, is something that seems to be implied by these, by, by this very partial uh, proactive control um, ability we found uh, among participants. So we, we do know from previous, a lot of previous studies that when people try very effortfully to suppress their thoughts, this um, either doesn't work very well or works for a very short time and then um, we 
see sort of a rebound. We also know that um, by having some sort of a mindful, accepting um, state of mind of allowing thoughts to just flow freely, trying not to intervene too much, uh, is something that can actually help with, with the experience of repetitive and wanton thoughts. I, I, I want to believe that our study suggests that one of the ways through which such acceptance or, or maybe not intervening with whatever happens by itself in the terms of thoughts um, helps is, is by allowing this automatic mechanism of very partial, again, but still proactive control to, 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 to act. And it might be the case, but we still need to examine this, so it's an hypothesis, not a result, that if we were to ask people to very effortfully suppress and um, repeat associations, we would have seen, um, we would not see the same um, ability to mitigate um, um, the extent to which thoughts become uh, self-reinforcing. So, um, yeah. I, I know, I know yeah. I'm, so it's, it's, not, it's not very concrete, but it, 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 it suggests like a direction that sort of um, is consistent with previous literature in terms of um, just trusting um, the automatic mechanisms that can do some, at least of the hard heavy lifting for us. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, thank you for that. And um, what about um, stress control? Um, did you ever test or are you planning to, in the future, to test if uh, when people are in a very stressful life phase versus then in a less stressful or using the, all these de-stress techniques, if maybe the, the association timing of negative versus positive um, associations kind of change with uh, diminished stress level? Yeah, it's it's again, it's a very good question. We definitely plan to. We, we we have so many questions we still need to examine. We need to examine first all the associations in this task were completely neutral. I mean, we didn't use any negative keywords, so we need to examine whether using negative keywords will have show a different pattern in the results. Then we need to examine whether um, again different state stress or state anxiety, what but just which is what you referred to, um, affects or moderates our effects. And, and then at the end, we have to examine how different um, micro interventions, if I may say, uh, that people use or recommend on, how do they affect these processes with negative or neutral thoughts? So there's so much more to examine here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. That's always the most exciting work. I think that leads to so many more projects and questions to answer. So congratulations again. And yeah, please flash your microphones. Um, maybe go in PTR order for everyone that has questions and came to the stage. Welcome. And uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Shiraz, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. So hi. Isaac, my question to you is that, you know, you talked about we have to preempt our thoughts. We have to stop them from coming. So what I wanted to ask you that, how do we stop these thoughts to have an emotional impact on us? I don't see that there's anything wrong with having, you know, lots of thoughts. There could be a deluge of thoughts, but how do we stop these thoughts from having an emotional impact? You know, for example, if, even if I consider many scenarios, it doesn't have to have a negative impact on me i could just observe them and they are there but why should i you know be flustered or feel anxious about them why how to how to decouple emotion from thought that's my question thank you yeah it's an excellent question to us thank you so much for asking it uh for two reasons the first is is that um it always i mean I, I, I really, it's really important for me to stress that I did not imply nor do I try to imply that what our study or the main question we ask um, implies is that we need to prevent our thoughts from coming to mind or need to preempt them. 
I'm I I believe that what we've shown is is not really a, at this level of we need to do something to prevent thoughts from happening, but rather suggesting that we already have mechanisms working automatically to do that for us. So I, I wouldn't want people to to sort of fear their thoughts and trying to preempt them because of that. That was not my intention at all. As as regarding your second. Um, uh, question, which is again um, an excellent question. It is not something we examined. It is again something we need to examine in the future in this task. Um, but we know um, from other studies and uh, clinical studies that um, as with every um, strong emotional response or fear, um, allowing oneself to, to experience this fear or the thoughts um, all the way through. So that does not mean sort of ruminating about specific issues. That means um, allowing even negative thoughts to come to mind. And even the negative emotional response to be experienced to the full uh, is something that can reduce the emotional response over time. So somewhat so the same way in which if someone is afraid, or let's say, of a spy of spiders, um, uh, the 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 more this person will sort of get closer to spiders, you know, allow him, oneself to to hold a spider or touch a spider or I don't know, but for a prolonged period of time, not for one second. It is something that can, I mean, you, you will see an increase in the emotional response in the short term, but then we usually see a decrease in the emotional response in the, in the long term. The, the, we think the same way uh, about um, unwanted thoughts, that experiencing them and their emotional reaction to the fullest um, allows them to sort of become um, not as dominant over time. Well, there's there's one thing here I want to you know state. I have read some papers where they had uh, you know examined patients who were uh, you know who had some lesions in their uh, orbitofrontal cortex, for example, and you know when they were put in, they were able to control their thoughts more proactively because they did not freeze in situations. So is it also related to our limbic system? Like if you if you are able to have less freeze response. Would that give you an enhanced ability to you know, proactively control your thoughts, Isaac? Yeah, I I, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know. Um, certainly, there, there's no way in which we can, you know, lesion people's brains in order to make them have less feelings. Um, I, what I'm suggesting is, is, in a sense, a bit of the opposite, that when we allow ourselves to experience our feelings um, all the way, not ruminating about them, not getting stuck, but to being as elaborate as possible, you know, with um, these feelings will become more and more uh, tolerable um, over time. Thank you. Hi, it's Katie. Um, thanks for a great question and the great response as well, Dr. Fadkin. I think you, you know, touched on that really well in your presentation as well, that it's, you know, in fact, the rumination and when it comes to um, conditions such as OCD. And thank you also for being really open about your journey. Um, I wish that we can all normalise as scientists having different health and mental health um, conditions um, and ADHD and everything like that um, as when, you know, it's the rumination of thoughts, not just a thought entering its head and uh, entering your head. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it and just wanted to um, I see that Path would like to speak and Siva and Shimi, we see you as well and would love to hear your questions. So um, Path, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for doing the room and uh, inviting me on stage. I really uh, enjoy this room, uh, though I'll join a bit late. So I have uh, more questions, more than questions, like uh, some thoughts and comments based on my limited understanding. I'm not a psychologist or a, a behavioral, behavioral expert. Uh, two examples come to mind. One is the example of the 
I'm looking at the big picture, no, of the neuroscientist James Fallon. I think uh, he's an American neuroscientist who was examining the PET scans of uh, tens of hundreds of psychopaths, and he finds that uh, eventually he makes this startling, shocking discovery that the scan with the, with the most neural correlates uh, uh, showing uh, psychopathy was his own, which he used as a control. And then he did a little bit of digging. Uh, so there, uh, he's quite popular. He's quite famous uh, in the in this particular uh, context. He goes on to say that he is a non-violent psychopath. In other words, he had all the neural cor- correlates as well as uh, a variant of this. I think it is a it's a gene involved in serotonin, the serotonin pathway. And technically speaking, he could have very well become a psychopath. But he argues he makes this compelling argument that he did not turn out to be a psychopath because of his upbringing. And uh, his hypothesis is that one may have the genetic mechanisms to become a psychopath, but it's like the bullets in a gun. Whether you shoot it or not depends on so many environmental factors. I think that was quite uh, very revealing, uh, the, the kind of hypothesis he has made. That is one example. On the other hand, we have the example of Charles Whitman, uh, who uh, had a brain tumor and he said he didn't know and he was uh, suffering from bouts of extreme anger and violent behavior which eventually led to him. I think he he killed a number of people and after his, uh, I think he also killed himself. Uh, let me just look, dig up. Uh, and then they it, they found that he did have a tumor in his head and that was uh, impacting his uh, behavior. So I think it's a very complicated, multi-layered topic Free will versus how much do we have control over our thoughts and behavior? That's a bigger picture. Um, I think one can also uh, uh, delve into philosophies like Stoicism. And I think somebody mentioned uh, Maslow's uh, ideas, theories, right? All these things come into uh, play. But I would, the one specific question I have, and I've been rambling on to uh, Dr. Isaac is, how much does childhood upbringing, uh, being raised in a good family and values imbibed have a role in uh, in all these things, you know, in human behavior in adulthood. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Parth. Um, yeah, you're asking me a question I can't answer, not in this general sort of sense. Um, there have obviously been so many studies um, asking a similar question in many different contexts. And, and we know by now that even though our genetics, that genetics are very important in most psychological or psychiatric uh, dimensions or f- phenotypes, um, the, the nurture, where it's a, a, you know, like a, a, a bringing it home or, or social environments or environmental factors all of these things have have a great impact um one very small thing i i I want to say is that concerning the the second study i presented not the first study um this i mean it's it's not a finding that we directly had but um it was it, it did surprise me very much that we had 11 psychiatric dimensions overall. And the three of them that showed some alterations in language or thought were dimensions that have to do with interpersonal difficulties, um, some of which are likely um, also related to to some interpersonal difficulties in social environments in um, early life. And and yeah, so, 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 it, it is something that um, is sort of everybody knows in psychiatry, in psychology, but in psychiatry it is often, um, it is sometimes sort of missed when sometimes people think about thought disorder, they think about this as some sort of a brain impairment that causes one to maybe be incoherent in, in speech or or thinking, but our findings um speak of and and relate to previous findings suggesting that this also has a very strong social interpersonal component um to it that we ought to understand much more about yeah thank you very much Uh, just uh, one quick follow-up comment rather than a question um i think we are still yet to completely 
I'm sure most of us would agree with that. We haven't completely understood the neural correlates of human behavior and uh, the the issue of free will versus uh, genetically predetermined behavior uh, is going to be uh, is, is going to be it will continue to be a Pandora's box in the future. Uh, I just shared some links in the in the chat section because even in, I have anecdotal experiences from people from families. You know, two children raised in the same family, the same value system, same environment. One child becomes, you know. Uh, a criminal, the other doesn't. Why, why do such things happen? And it's it's a uh, there all. One can always assume that these are outliers of examples, but uh, when there are uh, more than a few handful, that raises big questions. So, uh, but again, thank you again for this uh, room. It's very interesting, Rob. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I'm Arab. Hello, Welcome. am I yeah. uh, We can hear you now. Please go ahead and ask your okay, question. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> thank you so much for that, uh, your precious time. I would like to ask one question. Uh, we, we know that uh, mind will react uh, spontaneously for uh, involuntary retaliations. Uh, that mechanism, is it possible that mechanism for, uh, for unwanted thoughts? Uh, and uh, why so if it is not... Uh, if it is a different mechanism so how do we compare uh, these two mechanisms are different so this is my question thank you so, sorry can you repeat the first part how do we compare uh, the mechanism, or mechanism versus which uh, mechanism uh, mind will react for uh, spontaneous uh, involuntary retaliations uh, uh, i mean in, uh, in, what, what do you mean by involuntary yeah, retaliation? involuntary retaliations uh, Can same you give mechanism an example, maybe? Why, why i mean uh, uh, if my stop some bites uh, then immediately without uh, uh, spontaneously we react uh, like like that uh, uh, so short time retaliations uh, will happen right so uh, that mechanism is uh, why it is uh, different and why we why mind cannot apply that mechanism for uh, unwanted thoughts so that is uh, my question. I'm 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 sorry. I, it's probably me. I I still not sure I understood what you mean by um, retaliations exactly. Can you give maybe a concrete example of something like this happening? And uh, for example, if we are going uh, and suddenly some things will happen and we react right for that uh, incidents. So uh, those are short term incidents. So. Uh, and what is that mechanism and that is uh, is that different uh, from what we are discussing now <clears throat> do you do you mean like behavioral reactions how do behavioral reactions differ from thoughts uh, i mean sudden reactions uh, i can say simply in sudden, re sudden reactions uh, yes yes uh, mind will react very quickly for sudden reactions right so those we can just say involuntary retaliations so same kind that mechanism is a different for our present discussion or is both are same that is my question okay i, I i'm not sure I, i'm still fully understood i, I apologize for that um I, so i just want to very briefly say that one of the assumptions of the first study i, I showed is that this distinction between uh, proactive and reactive control, which is known mostly from behavior and maybe from something you can also call these immediate automatic reactions. Um, so whether people, so I gave this example of uh, standing at a traffic light with a car and then whether we um, can completely filter out unrelevant, like, um, um, traffic light becoming green or do we have to sort of first process it and then sort of try to ignore it after as as an example that might count as an immediate reaction um so 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 the assumption is that these two things might have shared mechanisms but i don't know maybe i did not um explain the question so if you have any follow-ups, feel free to, to maybe email me or, or write something and, and yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to do a quick check in with you, Dr. Franken, about your time. We've got um, Shimmy and Kyle on stage with questions, but others in the chat just wanted to check. Um, we just honour your time and don't want to take up too much. So just let us know how long you're available for, please. No, it's totally fine. I, I have like 15, 20 more minutes. So I would be happy to, to answer all questions. Um, if, 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 uh, unfortunately, I can't really sift through the chat. Um, so if, um, um, yeah, if someone wants to ask their chat written question out loud or something, that would be um, better. No problem at all. Um, I just wanted to say, um, Shimi, would you like to ask a question? Otherwise, I will um, sift through some of the chat questions as well. I just had, um, that'd be great, a quick question. Thank you, doctor. Um, when I, in terms of looking at eccentricity, social anxiety, and suspiciousness, I was trying to go through the slides. Do those three correlate with a greater, like a more pronounced um, population of proactive and reactive thought control? Like, do you find social anxiety to be more representative of proactive thought control? Or how do they, those interweave? Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, it wasn't very clear on the slides uh, because slides on uh, Clubhouse are always like very, yeah, it's difficult to understand them on their own. Um, no, so, so this was a different study in which we did not examine proactive uh, thought control at all. It only examined, in a sense, reactive thought control because it only examined um, the two mechanisms we examined there, the first of which uh, was not really about control, was simply about the dynamics of um, semantic retrieval. I mean, how organized one's semantics uh, networks or maps um, are or versus um, disorganized in the sense of being very um, stochastic. And the second was a reactive control uh, sort of process. So what we found there is that, uh, for example, eccentricity uh, was characterized by slightly more disorganized semantic maps. Uh, social anxiety was uh, characterized by uh, more organized, so less stochastic and more predictable semantic maps, more typical semantic maps in a sense. And suspiciousness was characterized by the very interesting uh, combination of um, less typical, uh, slightly more stochastic uh, semantic maps with uh, increased uh, reactive control over what what association people actually say out loud and which associations they came to themselves. Okay, great, thank you. And then what was, was the age group all like 18 and up or did you like, did you take an account for when people first started experiencing obtrusive thoughts? Yeah, in both studies, the age groups were uh, adults. So 18 okay. uh, and up, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I was just going through the chat and let me just go back. It's not, <laughs> it's not very um, coherent for me to multitask, um, but let me relay one of the last questions. So are you saying the more that we expose ourselves to fearful situations, our emotional reaction intensity will reduce over time? Thank you so much. Right, yeah. It, it it was something I said. It was not related to directly related to any of the research um, I did or I presented. It, it 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 is basically like a, a very common finding in in uh, anxiety um, research in general. For example, yes, generally speaking, the more if if we have something that invokes a fear response, um, usually the more we expose ourselves to that thing fully, uh, the lower it will the fear response become over time. Th there are some important subtleties in terms of how to do such um, exposures, right? So whether to, so for, so for instance, let's go back to the very simple uh, um, spider phobia example. If I had like a fear of spiders and then I would just, very briefly sort of touch a spider and then move my hand, that will not, maybe will not help reduce my fear response because I escaped the fear very quickly. But if I were to hold the spider in my hand for a prolonged period of time, as as uh, difficult as it sounds, uh, this will um, almost universally reduce uh, 
the fear response, yeah. Great, thank Great. you so much. Yes, I've heard of um, exposure therapy for things like fear of flights and I guess spiders and other other fears that we might have. So that's perfect. Um, I'm just going to take a moment again to sift through all the chat. Thank you, everyone, for all your great questions. Um, as Dr. Franken will have to leave shortly, this is your last opportunity to please raise your hand and come up and ask a question, or please type it in the chat and we can relay it. Um, and also welcome to listen back to the replay. And um, please just give me a moment to go through the chats. So I can't seem to be able to speak and go through messages at the same time. But thank you so much. Um, please go ahead, Katarina. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Katie. While you do that, I wanted to just comment or maybe, you know, Isaac, you have like a response to that comment. I, um, you know, in the back channel, um, some people were texting me and I think sometimes it's really interesting how sometimes simple analysis methods work much better to analyze our complex mind than very elaborate ones that you 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 know some people come up with and they are not very effective at um at dissecting out uh, symptoms we have like this time method is so elegant uh, for such a complex problem like do you see that pattern also that sometimes these things work way better um yeah <laughs> um it's, it's a really good question I, so I, I think that's what I mean for example you could come up with where your eyes are and how your posture is and analyze all the face muscles with AI you know and you probably yeah. wouldn't get such a um, uh, elegant result like way of testing it and, and the clear result like this yeah um i i i, I <laughs> it's a very complex and broad question i don't know how to start the answer um i think that um I, I'm, I'm reaction times seem to be a very simple thing even reactions right even like associations seem to be a very simple thing and and the free association task seem to be a very simplified very 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 simplified version of this very complex thing idea we call thoughts right um yet again even though associations and reaction times are such a th simple thing when we try to understand i, I think the the the, the, the thing that um, excites me the most is then we try to really get into this and to really understand the mechanism of what actually happens in the most in the things that seem very simple and and obvious for us then slowly they become l less and less obvious um so even though reaction times are a simple thing and it makes sense what i told you about like when responses should be slower when they should be faster um it makes intuitive sense it's it it's still i'm um, trying to understand why exactly um is it slower and when exactly might it be faster uh usually shows a very complex picture and and this is why i think that uh, having like a mathematical modeling like having a formal model of such mechanisms can help because these models are very very complex and very non-linear and so uh and and obviously the models themselves are um, a, a simplification but um yeah <laughs> Not sure I answered yeah. the, the question, but yeah, I yeah, just yeah, yeah. share yeah. some thoughts. If you, yeah, sure. If you want to know exactly how these um, habits form and, and the decisions are made in the brain, sure, it gets very complex and you can go into the molecular detail um, and how gene expression changes and all these levels of complexity. But just to have um, something everyone can actually grasp um, in everyday life, I feel like, um, you know, there are many ways people try to address this, like how your emotions are and 
look you know at all your muscles in your body how you walk how, you know all this complex ai models people try to build looking as i said looking at where your eyes move how your facial muscles move how your tone is of the voice but then you have this simple timing measurement and it just says as much you know i'm not I'm, I wasn't talking about, you know, how these uh, thoughts processes work themselves. That's a difficult neuroscience. But for this, just measuring um, the complexity underneath, but just measuring, um, you know, the, the symptom and, and, and maybe modifying the symptom is the simple way. <laughs> Julia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we always, like as scientists, we always like need a good reason to use a very, very complicated and expensive uh, method in the sense that we cannot examine the same question using simple methods. Um, and even more so, I think that it's really important to to really sort of link in a very well-informed manner the the very complex variables we can gather using um, neuroimaging in general or AI and neuroimaging or whatever you or all the other possibilities you, you mentioned to link them to people's actual experiences and, and actual um, yeah um, behavior um, it, it is something that is very important um, to do and it, it is something that having again a, a formal model um, often helps with because if you have some um, approximation of a mechanism, you can use this approximation to link different levels of um, analysis. So starting from you know brain, maybe even molecular, uh, going to behavior, experience, and so on. Well, yeah, well, it's really fascinating. Um, and we could probably talk on for years and never run out of questions in your research you know because there are so many levels that we can talk about this so i really appreciate um you coming here and sharing your work and um there's so much to do so uh maybe one of the last questions would be what are you working on right now and what are you planning or what would you love to be working on maybe um you know, in the very near future, because we want to follow your work <laughs> and invite you back again, so if you could give us a glimpse. <laughs> Thank you. That's very flattering. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm will be working on the, exactly the, the same questions I said that we. I mean, it wasn't just a, um, you know just just a way to answer to difficult questions. We we actually want to examine all of these questions about how we can. Um, what different types of variables and manipulations moderate proactive and reactive control over thoughts. Um, we also want to examine even further this idea of different of how uh, disorganization of thought and dysregulation of speech um, interact in a form of thought disorder in clinical and non uh, clinical populations. And, and in the most general sense, um, yeah, I, I, I really hope to continue investigating this very um complicated and not well defined um issue that is uh or thing that we call uh thoughts and how they work well perfect thank you so we are looking forward to um it's like um a, the next episode <laughs> waiting for the next episode <laughs> um yeah we it's um it's the wonderful uh also i think it's also always very encouraging to do these rooms um to learn like that um people like you are working on these uh, problems to kind of amir like ameliorate the human condition uh, that's always very positive with all these bad news out there to have these rooms. So um, thank you, Isaac, and for doing this work. And thank you, everyone, for coming here and for being here. A special thanks to Katie today. Um, she, you did a wonderful work moderating 
you made the room also and uh, Dr. <coughs> Mushanak, thank you so much for being here and everyone else and um, yeah, Isaac, as I said, you're always welcome back. Uh, thank you for giving the time here and uh, please come back one day. Maybe I'll reach out to you next year or so. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much for inviting me. It has been really interesting, really interesting discussion. And yeah, I mean, if anyone wants to contact me, please email me, feel free. Um, any further questions, ideas, all of this work is very, in a sense, preliminary and we're looking into very, every input we can get. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, thank you again. Okay. Oh, go thank ahead. You. I was just going to say thank you for a great talk and, and a wonderful room. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have actually another room later today. Um, it was kind of a rescheduling thing um, that we um, kind of ended up with uh, two rooms. So it's at noon uh, EST today um, with Dr. Lana. He will talk about his rejuvenation work, um, and he focuses on T cells actually for rejuvenation. He started a company uh, that is very promising, doing very promising um, work to find uh, treatments to treat aging. And um, he is looking, uh, he will talk about this recent work he published about intracellular transfer of telomeres in T cells. So he could transfer better tele telomeres that are longer in T cells, which is really exciting work. Um, so yeah, I hope you, uh, to hear you all back soon. And Isaac, again, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone and talk to you soon. I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye everyone, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.